Naughty, how you doing? I'm good, thanks, Joe. How are you, man? I'm doing well. Hey, I'm excited to get started in just a few minutes with today's webinar. By the way, welcome to everyone who's just still making their way in. We would love to have you uh, introduce yourself in the chat. So drop your name, where you're from. We'd love to get to know you. But Nadi, we're going to kind of warm up a little bit here, right? We're not, we're not officially starting the webinar yet. So if you're just making your way in, don't worry. You haven't missed anything. We just want to warm up, get to know each other a little bit with a couple of pre-show polls. So Nadi, you got the first one for us. All right, absolutely, Joe. Hey, first of all, let me also extend my welcome to everyone. So good to have you guys here and make sure you use that chat function because we'd love to hear from you, including your name, where you're from, what's going on now. Are you ready, Joe? Here is my first question. Knowing that you're in the United States, all right, <laughs> I want to know, is it American football or is it real football? It's a real football. Okay, <laughs> I see how it is here. All right, yeah, that's, yeah. that's good. That's good. I like this. So we want to hear from all of you, right? American football or real football? Uh, which, by the way, I've noticed even in London, uh, American football is, is making its presence known slowly but surely. No, but yeah, is it is it football or American football? So, you know, I think for me, obviously, I'm going to go with American football, but I love football. I love soccer. Uh, it's a great sport. Looking forward to the World Cup. But yeah, how about you? What, how, how would you answer okay, this? So it's a bit of a truth time for me, Ryan. Obviously, I'm in Australia. You know, you can probably tell from my accent. But I have a soft spot for American sports. In fact, I like coach my son's baseball team. And, you know, and so as much as I would love to say American football, though, in the off season, my little boy plays soccer. So I've got to say real football. So yeah, sorry, real Joe. football. And, and, I, and I like uh, the, I like how we're putting real football, right? Uh, it's laying <laughs> the gauntlet out there. Um, but yeah, let's give a few more seconds for people as they make their way. And first of all, if you're just if you're just coming in, welcome. Uh, drop your name and where you're from in the chat. We'd love to get to know you. And then answer this poll question, American football or real football? No, no, it's not real football. It's just real football. <laughs> it's just football, right? <laughs> yeah, football. Yeah, it looks like that's the overwhelming, uh, no surprises here in, in this no webinar. Uh, so, so that's great. Wow, it's even it's even creeping up higher. 88%, 80, 88%, 13%. Look at Doing the math there, that that's not 100%, Ooh. so but close. All right, so that's that's good. That's just a like 80-20 split here. Let's go on to the next one. This is a little bit more serious, right? Um, but we want to get to know each other by asking this question. Who has made the most significant impact in your life as a follower of Jesus? Parent, big, pastor, big. teacher, mentor, friend, or other? By the way, if you click other, we would love for you, we would love to kind of know who is your other. Who's that person? Uh, or maybe that group of people who have made an impact on your journey as a, as a follower of Jesus. So, so go ahead and, and answer that question. Um, as you I put bet. your name and, and, and where you're from in the chat, we'd love to get to know you. But it looks like friend is, a, is the quick, early leader. Quick response. Uh, hey, Joe, yeah. tell me something. Uh, you know, for you, what's the answer to this question? Oh, for me, it's probably, I mean, all, all of these, I could probably have a person in there I could click on. But man, for me, it's a youth pastor. My youth pastor in high school, he he discipled me, mentored me, helped me find, you know, kind of discover my calling into ministry, into church ministry. How about you, Nadi? You know what? I mean, like you, I could probably name all of these people and they, I mean, other than other, I struggle with other to kind of figure out exactly what that is. But, we, you know, they could all speak into my life and I could name it. But for me, I reckon it was, it was my dad. Like he passed away when I was just nine and, you know, he was a great man of faith. He lived his life out for the gospel and... You know, I, I witnessed him actually just never take his eyes off Jesus. And, mm -hmm. and it's that legacy that I feel like I have in my life. And so I, I'd have to take parent. Yeah, that's that's what it's all about. But whoever it is, you know, today we're going to be talking about impact and the impact that teens can make on this world. And I think a lot of that has to do with who who's in their lives that, that are pouring into them. And and we're going to be talking about that more as the webinar goes on. But but Nadi, we got a full program. We're going to get started in just a few minutes. Hey, Joe, I can't wait. I'm super excited. And um We'll be back in just a few moments. Yeah, we'll see you in two.
Hey, well, welcome to this amazing open generation webinar. I, this is like the third, you know, that has gone through and I'm super excited to be here. My name's Noddy Sharma and this is my co-host, Joe Jensen. Joe, hey man, how are you? I'm doing well, Noddy. Good to see you. Uh, man, this, what a thrill it is to be able to, to be at webinar number three. What a journey so far, right? Um, in case you're just joining us, uh, this is the third of three webinars in a series uh, called The Open Generation. We're launching this huge project, this research project uh, that's global uh, on the kind of the state of teens today and, and how they're growing in their faith, engaging with Jesus, the Bible, and how they're having an impact on the world. Uh, by the way, we would love to get to know you. So again, if you haven't done so already, leave your name and where you're from in the chat. We'd love to connect with you there. Um, but Nadi, yeah, today we're gonna answer this question, how are teens around the world making an impact and this is, again, part three. So part, part one was how are teens around the world relating to Jesus? Last week, we talked about how are teens around the world are viewing the Bible. And then today's impact. So, so Nadi, uh, it's been jam-packed full of insights. I know we, it's probably hard for you to pick one, but what's one thing that stood out for, to you from the first two webinars? You know, it's, it's so hard to pick one, Joe. There's so many of them, right? I mean, incredible. But you know, there was, there was a line that, uh, that, that Daniel said, and we'll hear from him again today, but there was a line he said in the last one, and uh, he said that, that the open generation are more interested in connection than they are in content. And that just stuck with me. I thought, you know what, that is so good because that just reminds us that actually we're relational beings. And, yeah. and so much, we spend so much time thinking about the content, but actually the connection trumps it. And human connection is, is just so powerful. Uh, you know, that just was a stand out to me. What about you, Joe? What stood out to yeah, you? Yeah, like, like you said, it's hard to pick one, but I would kind of maybe combine a couple things. I think we, I saw, you know, in, in the data, this correlation between like this relationship and connection with Jesus and engagement with scripture and an overall impact on, on a young person's well-being and mm. they're all flourishing in life, right? Like when you see that they're engaged with Jesus in the Bible, you see in the data a direct correlation with how they're doing in the relationships, how they're connecting community, how they're doing with well-being, and how they're making an impact, right? And that's the cool thing about this study is we're, we're studying how teens are relating to Jesus, engaging with the Bible, and impact, and all three of those work together. And really kind of when you read the Gospels, right, that's what it's all about is, is this abundant life that Jesus has promised. And I know, Nadi, for you guys at World Vision, this is like close to your heart, this, this generation. Uh, and, and, and so, yeah, I mean, tell us a little bit about why World Vision is at the table on this, because it matters to you guys. Yeah, sure does, Joe. And you, I mean, you named part of it just then, right? That connection between who Jesus is, the, the gospel, the Bible, the scripture to us, and, and like the outworking of that in life is so important. And we've seen that. I mean, you go back over history and every cool movement that started around the world has started with, with someone with this deep faith conviction that mm -hmm. comes out and says, hey, that's not okay in the world, we need to change it. And that, that's usually started by a young person with this dream and conviction, steps into it, does it before they actually get told they can't do it. Yeah. And, you know, we've seen that just sustainable. I, I mean, World Vision started in that space and, and we want to be able to posture ourselves to say continually to the next generation coming, we're listening, we're here. What, what, are, you, what are you dissatisfied with? What can you see that needs changing? And you're going to be best equipped to be able to do that. So we want to be able to listen and invest in you and unleash you so that you can actually do greater things we ever thought possible. Yeah, so that's, that's a why great question. That important. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great vision. And that's why we love partnering with you guys at World Vision, because you guys have that heart. And, and in fact, there's, it's not just World Vision and Barna on this. In, in case right. you're, you're new to this whole webinar series and the project, this is like a, this is like a combination, a collective of organizations who have come together to say, this generation matters. Not only do they matter, but we want to learn from them. We want to be led by them. We want to listen to them. So uh, you can see on the screen, like this, this is World Vision and Barna, but coming to the table with Biblica, Alpha, uh, ACSI, Christian Vision, Christ and Youth, Bible Study Fellowship. I mean, you look at this, it's like such a great vision of what the kingdom's all about, right, Nadi? About organizations coming together saying, we, we're going we're gonna to invest in this next generation and learn from them and be led by them, which I think is an important part of the whole thing. You know, and I think it's a great point to call out, Joe, right? It's a, it's a collective thing. We, we actually realize we all need each other to lean into this same question, these yeah. same problems, because we're only going to be able to do it together. Hey, Joe, you know, I, I'll tell you something else that I love that's come out of this is the resources that's coming out. And yeah. I mean, hey, 
just run us through a little bit because I know this is just the beginning and it's a culmination of a lot of work, but what's the resource that's coming out of this stuff? Yeah, like we, we try to make it easy, as easy as possible for people to engage, right? So we, we're trying to land everything on one website. So opengeneration.info, you can go there, you can engage with the data in a deeper way on the top right hand corner of the site, you can, you can uh, click this button that allows you to go in and engage with the data. And it's interactive data tables. It's also you can also purchase a journal. Because what we're what we're what we're covering today in an hour is just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more data, so many more insights. So you can purchase the journal at OpenGeneration.info. There's a great free resource that Nadia and I you, we're going to tell everyone about a little bit later in the program called the Open Generation Challenge. And you can go back and watch the replay. So we just I would encourage you bookmark this page. It'll come in handy in the coming months because this is just the beginning. We have so many more resources. And what's really cool is not just global resources on global research, but we have country and regional level insights as well, Nadia. And I know you guys are excited about that in Australia. Oh man, we're so excited. And, and I wanna encourage you, if you're watching right now and you're thinking, hey, what's this resource about? Make sure you jump on, check it out. Because like, you know, each country has its own report, which means you can dig in and localize it to where you're at. And so just keep checking back to make sure, because as Joe said, this is just the beginning. Hey, Joe, we've got a jam-packed program ahead of us, man. We've got David Kinneman, CEO of Barna, actually unpacking some data. We've got Daniel uh, Copeland, actually also unpacking some data, also from Barna. We've got Daniel Strickland doing an interview, and we've got a great panel of just experts in the room, which, you know, I'm so looking forward to chatting them and, and just gleaning from their wisdom around, you know, this next generation, what they see. Hey, Joe, we need to get going, but let me remind everyone, there is this great function here in the chat. You know, if, if at any point in time, you know, there's a question that's burning on you or you want to make a comment or you want to highlight something that's being said, do that. Make sure you do ask lots of questions, put the comments in. We want to know what's burning in your heart. We want to be able to hear it and call it out and learn from each other in this space too. So Joe, are you ready? Yeah, let's do it. And by the way, one, one quick thing too, there's a stage translation. So if you're in a region, a country, uh, maybe your native tongue, uh, it, you can go in this list and, and you have up to 22 languages you can choose from. So be sure to take advantage of that. And uh, let's just interact with each other. We want to learn from each other in the chat, like like Nadi said. So yeah, let's get started. We got David Kinneman to kick us off, right? Yeah, we do. Awesome. We are so glad to have you here as we talk about the open generation. We have been diving deep, focusing on today's teenagers and their attitudes towards Jesus, their views towards scripture. And now we want to talk about their, uh, their perspectives related to making an impact in the world. One of the defining characteristics of this emerging generation of teenagers. Um, this has been a labor of love. Um, we have been working with some incredible partners, Biblica, Alpha, World Vision, ACSI, Bible Study Fellowship, uh, Christian Vision and Christ in Youth, and uh, not only are those organizations really great, uh, the people behind those organizations are incredible, and it's been uh, an honor for us to be able to listen to nearly 25,000 teenagers around the world, um, 16 different languages, 26 countries, you can see the sampling methodology here, um, a really, really incredible study, such an honor for us at Barna to be a part of it, our biggest study ever. And um, I think there's such a, a, a great way for us as leaders to, to sort of stop talking and thinking about ourselves for a minute and actually listen in on what someone else is thinking. I think that's one of the great benefits of research uh, is that we actually get to, to listen in on what someone else might be thinking and perceiving about the world. So um, here we go. We want to talk about today's teenagers and their attitudes about, about Jesus, about the Bible, and about justice. If this is your first webinar, uh, you can go back and rewatch some of the other webinars we've done on Jesus and on the scriptures. Um, today, we're going to be talking about impact and on justice. And our goal is to equip you, whether you're an educator or a pastor or a leader, uh, a parent, maybe you're even a teenager yourself and you're interested on what's on the minds of uh, your peers. And so here we are. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Now, uh, this whole project is divided into these three studies, these three different reports. Um, they're all meant to go together and kind of interconnect. Um, um, they're digital, and you can also get them in print. These are the covers of those. <clears throat> and the idea was to focus in on these three different topics that, that really relate to one another. Like, we believe that Jesus was, was, was died and crucified and was resurrected and is coming again. We build our lives on the authority of Scripture, 
And then it's not just so that we can have a great holy huddle, but so that we can make lives of impact, live lives of impact, go out there and make a difference because of our faith, because of what our faith compels us to do. And as a result, we have this kind of faith resilience. And we think all three of these topics are deeply interconnected. That's why we chose them and why we, we've sort of structured this whole study this way. Now, uh, again, we want to take a deep dive today on the perspectives related to impact, how teens around the world can make an impact and their attitudes on a wide range of topics that I think are so important to our current environment and our, our, our current conditions in the world. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to show you some of the things that most teens agree about. Um, there's a lot of things that in our society we find disagreement and uh, we're polarized and there's a lot of ex extremes. But when we look at the things that teenagers around the world agree on, we find a lot of common ground. So I'm hopeful for the world's future. 57% of all teens uh, say that's true of them. 11, only 11% 11 say they're not hopeful. 59% say they can make a positive impact in the world. Uh, only 7% say that they can't make a positive impact in the world. Um, look at the fact that Christians are even a little more likely uh, to say that's true. So the, the, the faith of affiliation uh, seems to orient them towards that kind of impact in the world. Another widespread agreement here, 44% agree strongly and 43% agree somewhat that my generation has the ability to make a positive and meaningful impact on the world. Uh, another really cool finding. Um, today, how motivated are you to do something about injustices in society? And in our survey, we said by injustices, we are referring to the unfair or undeserved treatment of people. And again, you can see that nearly uh, four out of every five teenagers agree or agree somewhat with that, agree strongly or somewhat. And um, again, among Christians, it's about the same percentage. What's fascinating to me is that when we look and we kind of slice the data related to faith affiliation on many of these same kinds of ideas, we can look at conviction and commitment and other kinds of things related to serving others. I believe it is important to protect the well-being of all people. Uh, change, I believe, is important to change conditions that cause individual suffering. And you'll notice that, again, most teens around the world agree with those statements, um, especially Christian teens and other teens who have uh, faith other than Christianity. It's a little lower among those teens who have no faith affiliation uh, in terms of holding those two convictions. Now, what about confidence? Um, I'm confident that I can make a positive impact on others' lives influence others to promote fairness and equality. Again, people of faith, teens who have a faith affiliation, whether Christian or otherwise, are a little more likely to believe that. It's actually those teens that do not have faith that are, are lacking in their confidence. And let's not forget that our scriptures give us lots of, lots of reasons to do that. I mean, this is just a small sample of the, the verses that relate to justice and serving the poor and, and the fatherless and the oppressed. Uh, Micah 6 eight, do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly uh, with your God. And you can see, and there's many, many other examples of the scriptural guidance that we have to live lives of impact. Again, this idea that our beliefs in Jesus and our attitudes and, and uh, commitments to scripture lead us to the kinds of commitments that allow us to live lives of impact. It's not just that the church should be a holy huddle. It should be for preparing us for lives outside in the real world especially on behalf of those who are most in need. This is something that the teenagers around the world that we talk to uh, tell us in no uncertain terms. They want to see the church active and alive and, 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 and busy and effective outside the walls of the church, not just a, not just a place for worship and sort of, you know, the kind of the, the, the privatization of religion, but the, the activa activation of religion out in the world. So um, we, we took a, a really interesting look at this data and we took these three different concepts of conviction and confidence and commitment. And you, we just kind of went through those different slides. I just showed those to you. Um, conviction included these two statements, just to refresh your memory. Confidence was positive impact on others' lives and influencing others to promote fairness and equality. And then commitment was uh, commitments about the future. And, and you can see them listed here. And then what we do with our, our uh, data and our amazing team of researchers is we create categories. We researchers love to nerd out. <laughs> we geek out on, uh, on creating categories. And so here's a new category for you. We actually created a, a group of teens called Justice Motivated. Uh, and they actually hold conviction and confidence and commitment on all three of those areas. They had strong agreement around conviction and confidence and commitment. Those teens who were justice oriented uh, middle category, they only affirmed one or two, and those that were neutral 
uh, were, uh, did not affirm any of those three commitments. Again, part of the reason I show you these statements is I know terms like justice and impact can uh, cause some consternation. We're just trying to help you understand this is what we took a picture of in our social research related to justice and impact. And so then we categorize people into being justice motivated uh, and, and, and that they had agreement with those statements. So just so you can understand how it is that maybe be in your context, you might want to measure their desire to make a difference or their desire to make an impact. And again, choose how you'd like to do that uh, based on, on your religious tradition, your theological tradition, the things that make sense for you. What we're here to tell you is that teens around the world, and we're almost certain the teens in your tradition and in your church, are interested in making a difference. They want to see their lives used on behalf of changing the trajectory of others' experiences in a good way. And so here's what this looks like across the whole globe. Um, you can see here in North America, um, uh, with, with in, in the context of the U.S., 25% are uh, justice-motivated, 50% are justice-oriented. Uh, and again, across these different contexts, you can see Central and South America and Africa very, very likely to be either justice-motivated or at least justice-oriented. Uh, in, in Europe, the, it's sort of the continent with the least orientation towards justice, uh, but still the vast majority of, uh, of young people in each of those contexts are either justice motivated or at least justice um, uh, oriented. Um, and then in Indonesia, uh, Korea, Malaysia, Taiwan, India, and the Philippines, kind of a wide spectrum of, of responses there. But when you look at this across the kind of the zoom out a bit, and you just notice that there is a, a huge contingent of young people across different faith groups, but even within Christian teens. In fact, they're more likely to be justice uh, motivated. Um, across all these different contexts, there's a huge percentage of teens who want to see change in the world, who want to serve others, who want to be activated for good. And, and our conclusion from this is that we as church leaders, as those who care about teenagers, should, should have this commitment. We have a chance to activate a generation uh, as we disciple them, part of the discipleship um, in their lives in Christ, in their commitments to Scripture, is about living their lives for others, to nurture their healthy impulses, to making a difference in their lives, a, a lasting difference, a sustainable difference, a real difference, and then provide outlets for their motivation to do that. Um, a few years ago, we did this study called uh, The Connected Generation, and we found that millennials, uh, 18 to 35-year-olds, we're interested in the church, not just being a place for a sort of private worship, but for public expression of their, of their gifts and making a difference in the real world, in their workplaces, through their callings and vocations, uh, through caring about c corruption and environmental change and all the things that I think matter uh, to this generation that they tell us in our surveys are so important to them. Uh, they want the church to be a laboratory for leadership, not just a place for private worship. And so as we think about that, um, I just want to close with this last scripture, which is, uh, which is found in Ezekiel. And we've been talking about this open generation. They're open to others. They're open to the needs of others. And I believe we as a church have an opportunity to open ourselves up to the kinds of things that this generation is asking of us. And uh, in that way, I think this is such an incredible scripture because it tells us that we should have open and tender hearts uh, God says, I will give them singleness of heart and put a new spirit within, within them. I will take away their stony and stubborn heart and give them a tender, responsive heart, maybe even an open heart. And uh, so they will be, obey my decrees and regulations, perhaps even in serving the least of these. And then they will truly be my people and I will be their God. I believe this generation is, is open. It represents some challenges because they're open to anything and everything. But it also represents a huge opportunity for us because I believe this generation is telling us that they want to see their lives make a difference. They want to be on mission with Jesus in the real world. And that is a great invitation that all of us as the church can embrace. Yeah, that's exactly right, David. Uh, it's a great invitation for all of us as leaders. And so thanks for sharing those great insights. By the way, if you're frantically trying to take notes and you miss something, you're like, hey, what, what, what did David say here? That's what the replay's for. So we just want to encourage you to, to check out the replay at opengeneration.info. That'll be up in just a few hours. But we also want to just point you to the fact that, like we said earlier, 
Uh, this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's so many more insights uh, that, that came out of the research we did. And we try to capture a lot of those in this journal uh, that our editorial team of Barna uh, came out with as we partnered with, with World Vision and, and these other great partners. And you can find that at opengeneration.info. And there is a promo code OPEN15, OPEN15, uh, where you can get a special webinar 15% off discount. Uh, so again, go get the journal. It's it, uh, Trust me, you won't regret it. There's a print version. There's also a digital version. So opengeneration.info. By the way, you can get a bundle where you can get all three at a discounted rate. Now, in the chat, somebody asked, like, is the discount code, does that apply to the bundle? The bundle is actually already pre-discounted. So um, you, you don't have to worry about putting in a code for that. And it's a great deal for, for all three of those as well. So just want to encourage you to check that out. Um, Hey, in a few moments, we're going to hear some more great research insights uh, from Daniel Copeland, our AVP of research at Barna. And he's going to really get down into like a regional country um, level, which I think uh, you're, you're really going to benefit from. Before we go to Daniel, uh, I want to, we're going to actually get to listen in, and watch a conversation with Daniel Strickland. And what's special about this conversation, there's two things that I really love. First of all, uh, Danielle is actually being interviewed by this dynamic young Gen Z leader named Michaela Nemhard. In fact, if you were at last week's webinar, she co-hosted with me and she did such a great job, dynamic 23 year old. And, and so Danielle actually turns it around on her, asks her a couple questions, which is a really cool dynamic. And the second thing is you'll see at the end of the, of the interview that we're, that Danielle actually, uh, we had a chance to sit down with this amazing young woman, uh, Serafina in Ghana. And it's just like a great exclamation point on this whole element. So uh, before we turn it to Dan Daniel, let's let's listen in on this conversation with Daniel Strickland. Hello and welcome. I'm Michaela Nemhard, and I'm here interviewing the one and only Daniel Strickland. <laughs> Danielle, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you for being here. Yeah, it's a joy to be here. Yeah, absolutely. Danielle, okay, so we're talking about how research shows us that my generation wants to have a real meaningful impact on the world. Mm. In my experience, that usually starts when there's someone in my life who actually believes I can have an impact. Mm. And when you were younger, was there someone like that for you who empowered you and believed in you? And how did that shape the way you looked at yourself and your ability to make an impact? Yeah, that's a fascinating question for me because I had a bit of a wayward childhood. <laughs> so I feel like it's not sort of the normal, right. you know, yeah. answer. But I do remember this one weird moment when mm. I was in a courtroom uh, deciding the future of my life, whether I would be incarcerated for a long time or if I would be released to go to a drug treatment program. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the judge in the case actually you know, went in the direction of the drug, drug treatment program and mm -hmm. said, now I don't remember this, but my mother wrote it down Wow! because the judge said, I need you to go mm -hmm. and be the leader you were meant to be. But I think even just those words spoken over me in that really weird place of like not thinking of myself in that way at all. Right. And then this judge sort of even distanced from my life, mm -hmm. but able to prophetically you know, say something yeah. of value and worth and seeing that this misbehave, this misdirected capacity was actually leadership mm -hmm. misdirected. Uh, I think that mattered a fair bit. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. Okay. I, I want to say like, even for me, I think someone that's impacted my life too is um, my mom. She is the biggest cheerleader. She literally cheers me on. She pours into me. She tells me that I can do it. I have like impact. My mm -hmm. words have impact and meaning and that to not shy away from the spotlight, Yeah. you know, so, and to like actually walk forward into it. So it's like amazing. a queen. Yeah. Ex oh my gosh. You know her, you know her so well, <laughs> literally a warrior. Yeah, literally. Yeah. Oh man. So I have another question for you. So what advice do you have for me and others in my generation to, um, as we step into the future? Yeah, I think some of those things that you just shared about mm -hmm. what impacted you about your mother, what I would yeah. love for this generation to understand is that mm -hmm. what they do, what they think, what they see, what they feel matters. Yeah. And not to shy away from the opportunities that they do have whenever they have them mm -hmm. to speak up, yeah. to say so, to give their perspective, to share their heart. Mm -hmm. Because I think that their perspective, their heart, their feelings, what they're experiencing right now matters. Yeah. And actually are gonna be, ah, uh, they're gonna be leading the way of mm -hmm. the future. 
whatever it is, use your influence for good yeah. wherever you can. Absolutely. And you practice that so that you're ready for that yeah. as uh, those opportunities come. Yeah, oh, amazing. Thank you for that. Oh my yeah. goodness. Oh, wow. Okay. I have one uh, thing unique about the Open Generation study yeah. is that Barna partnered with uh, World Vision to interview teens in more marginalized communities mm -hmm. who don't have the same access to technology and often are underrepresented in a study of, the, of this like size. This included youth within communities uh, the World Vision partners with in Brazil, Honduras, Indonesia, Kenya, Philippines, and Syrian refugees living in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. Not only was that important to World Vision, Barna found that teens worldwide said it was very important that all people have a chance to speak and be heard, and that people are allowed to participate in making the decisions that affect their lives. So Danielle, mm -hmm. why is this so important? And in what ways do you think this models the way of Jesus? Yeah, I mean, first of all, what an awesome reflection yeah. from people who maybe also feel the sting of mm -hmm. being unheard right. or feeling invisible. And so one of the neat things about that study's uh, reflections and outcomes mm -hmm. in terms of hearing that pattern being told is that I feel like the entire Bible is a story of God going out of his way to get in the way of marginalized, invisible people wow. and centering them in the yeah, story. Yeah. So in some ways, it's one of the most encouraging things in the world because what that generation's desire mm -hmm. is for is actually the exact same desire God has as well, wow. which is to center people who have been decentered by society. So I love that those things match. Yeah. And the other thing I was I was going to say is one of the things I've been most challenged by and learning from the person of Jesus is mm -hmm. how engaged he was in using questions yeah. to hear from people and to give people autonomy over their own decisions. Mm -hmm. So even when Jesus is, you know, someone's yelling out for healing, for example, mm -hmm. and Jesus will say, okay, come here. Yeah. And then when the person comes here, he'll say, what would you like me to do? Yeah. Now, I mean, I would just assume... Healed it. Like, obviously, right, he right. wants to be healed. healed. The guy's blind, yeah. you know, like, whatever it is. <laughs> yeah. But Jesus will say, what do you want me to do? Right. Because them expressing their decisions and their choice and even to hear their mm -hmm. voice is somehow restoring the, the way they were made. Humans were made with leadership capacity, with influence, with choice, with autonomy, with decisions that they could make, with a voice to be heard. Mm -hmm. And Jesus is not content to just fix whatever problem they have. What he, he's really after is to give them back the agency they've always had as human beings. So I think to, for that to be the ask mm -hmm. is like, yay, that's what God yeah. wants to do. That's what Jesus modeled how to do. Yeah. And maybe in this season, what we're doing is rediscovering what we were always supposed to be doing anyway. I, I even think even for like even my generation too, uh, just speaking on behalf of them, there's a lot of our uh, previous kind of like leaders. I mean, they're, they're still in power right now, but huh. they're making decisions for us. So it's like, they're not really listening into what we have to say, you know? Mm -hmm. We kind of feel like we're not being heard. Mm -hmm. And and it, it's, if we feel stuck. Mm -hmm. I think that's what it is, we feel stuck. So it's that, um, you know, that agency, I love that you said that, that, that turning it around and saying like, you know what, no, let's ask you the question. Like, how do you think about, like, what do you think about this? Like, how do you feel? So absolutely. Yeah, 100%. and even like, what are the solutions? Yeah. Right. Because how am I going to come up with, you know, solutions to people feeling marginalized mm -hmm. and invisible and unheard yeah. if I've never really been marginalized, invisible, or right. unheard? I don't know. So it's also the solutions to the problems come from the very people who experience those problems, right. not from the people who don't. Right. So Michaela, some awesome questions that you asked me that I got to answer, mm -hmm. and now I'd like to ask you some. Hit it. I want to ask you as a leader, mm -hmm. What are the best things I could do to empower young people around me? Man, that's a good question. Well, Danielle, look at you. Look what you're doing. Like, I would say just continue to do that. Continue to pave that way. Mm -hmm. Continue to open doors and to speak to things that are, like, that have been there for so long, like those structures, you know? Mm -hmm. Those racist structures, those misogynist structures. Like, just continue to tear that down. Mm -hmm. Because people like me, like young people like me are seeing that and we're like, we're empowered. Mm -hmm. We're empowered by you, mm -hmm. you know? And we feel like you believe in us too and that pushes us to want to continue to keep like opening doors for ourselves as well, you know? And, and I just love that you also kind of like have that open hand, you know? You're like, come on, let's go, mm -hmm. you know? So I appreciate that from you. Mm -hmm. And I pray for more people like you. 
yeah. in this generation. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah. That's a, even just that like intentional inclusivity yeah. is so powerful. Yeah. And that's yeah. one of the patterns of Jesus's ministry too that impacts me a lot. Like I always say Jesus went out of his way to get in the way <laughs> of the right. right people. But if you look around and all you see are people like you yeah. at the center of the story, then take a page out of the life of Jesus and get out of, go out of your way to get in the way of right. people who are not like you and places that yeah. don't reflect your values and things like that. So Danielle, this has been such a great conversation. And as we end, I know you've had the chance to do such great work around the globe and you've met and worked with some pretty amazing young people. And you recently told me about Serafina. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about her? So Serafina represents, probably mm -hmm. is a really good representation of the best of the generation in yeah. terms of that desire that that generation mm -hmm. has to be heard, to use their voice, to change things, to mm -hmm. activate in their own local communities. Uh, she's modeling, right. like she's actually living that yeah. out. So as a, a young woman in a, a context in Africa, mm -hmm. seeing injustice happen, yeah. her desire and actually her stated desire is to end violence against children. Right. Like it's not a bad life. It's amazing. <laughs> it's yeah. not a bad thing to give your life no. to. Uh, I think at that age, my desire was just like to stay out of jail. <laughs> so what could God do with a young person who is dedicated mm -hmm. their entire life? Yeah. And another thing that she says, which has impacted me a lot, is mm -hmm. I want to use all the influence I have mm -hmm. for good. Wow. And again, even just to name that, that young, and to dedicate yourself. And then the other thing I think that exemplifies the generation, which I think I'm learning from a lot, is it's fine to have lofty ideals, mm -hmm. but it's a whole different thing to have amazing ideals and then get to work. Yeah. And Serafina is one of those women that has these incredible ideals. Like, I also want to end violence against children everywhere, so like, count me in. Right. But she's begun. Yeah. You know, she's begun the work. As a young woman who was told, you don't count, you can't yeah. do anything, life's just this way, this is cultural, mm -hmm. it's not your business. Right. She's like, it is my business and watch. Watch me work. Yeah, watch yeah. me work. Yeah. And I think that spirit, yeah. belief system, faith, and then also just that audacity mm -hmm. to get to it. Yeah. You know, sign me up. I want to be led by Serafina. Yeah, mm -hmm. I feel you. That's me too. Me too. Man, Danielle, thank you so much for sitting down with me and having this important conversation. Now let's listen to the conversation with Serafina. Well, hey, Serafina, it's so good to see you in person, even though it's on a screen. I'm so thrilled to meet you after being inspired by your story and talking a lot about how your example is one for a, a generation to look to. Um, can you tell me a little bit, I, you've been an advocate, uh, a leader against child marriage, both in your own community in Ghana, but also to world leaders using your voice with great authority. What has this taught you about the power your generation has to make an impact in the world? Thank you, Daniela. And I'm also very happy to meet you and to share these great experiences with you. Yes, yeah, so actually... Through the advocacy works I've been doing and then meeting other young children around the world, listening to my generation, I can see that there is a lot of a lot of potentials in this generation. You see, we are in the 21st century where the spread of knowledge is, is so quick. Within an instant, knowledge is spread vast across the whole globe. Yes, yeah, so I, I actually see this generation to be full of so much potentials and so much power. And I can see that if this generation would focus their, their mind onto eliminating violence against children, they can actually do it. If we all agree together and come together as one and then purpose in our mind to do something, we can do it because we are full of so much power. Yeah, I strongly believe that. What's been your greatest challenge in becoming an advocate? Oh, actually, my greatest challenge was the fact that I was a female. And that not being enough, I was also from a village in the northern region where the voices of females is, is considered nothing. The voices of females is not heard. Yes, yeah, so that was my greatest challenge, being a female and then also being in a community where the voices of girls are not heard. 
but all through it, I was able to sell out and then I am now making my voice known. That's so beautiful. I mean, the story that we're uh, looking at is how women listening to God and doing what God said were the start of one of the greatest deliverance stories in the Bible. And, yeah. um, and so we, we see echoes of that in the way that you said no to the things <laughs> that you can't live with to other these <laughs> children being given over into marriage. What is your hope or advice for other young people around the world? There is this famous saying I like, and I actually got it from a book I read, a novel I read. I actually love reading novels, yeah. And it is Law 34, and it is found in Robert Dree's 48 Laws of Power. Yeah, so the Law 34 says that, be royal in your own fashion. Act like a king to be treated as one. So indeed, as young leaders, as children out there, we must always rise up to demand for what is rightly ours before others around can come up to support us. And so in any situations we find ourselves, to my colleague young leaders out there, never be afraid, just believe in yourself, stand up. And once you stand up for yourself, you will get people to support you. That is the basic principle of everything. Once you are able to stand up and demand for what is rightly yours, you are going to get supporters. Um, Serafina, I want to thank you. Uh, not just personally. Personally, I'm inspired by you. You keep me hopeful. I'm um, thrilled that you're leading the future. I really am. Yeah. I feel really good about it. <laughs> I also am challenged enough to, um, to try to make a better way for more and more people of your generation to do what it is you've been called to do. So thank you so much, but not just me personally, on behalf of the pastors and the leaders who are going to be using this resource and who are inspired by you, and then the, the tons of young people who need examples like you to look to. I just want to thank you so much for the way that you not just communicate well about these principles and advice and hope and experience, but how you're living your life well. And uh, it matters so much, and we're so grateful. And uh, we're really believing that your example is going to make a big difference, not just where you are, but all around the world. Thank you. Thank you, too. Wow. Well, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good day to all of you. It is such a pleasure to learn from incredible leaders like Michaela, Danielle, and Serafina. And we're so thrilled that they were able to be a part of this journey with us. If we've never met before, my name is Daniel Copeland, and I'm the Associate Vice President of Research for Barna Group. And it is my joy to be with you guys to share some more data that, uh, about what we've learned among the open generation on about how they would like to make an impact. And I'd actually start like to start our time today by just hypothesizing with you guys for a second. Uh, We've got a poll question that you're going to answer. And I'd love to know, do you think today's teens feel like the Christian church is making a difference on issues such as poverty and justice? Uh, what do you think in your context? Do you think that teens have this perception of the church? Do they definitely feel like that? Maybe it's probably, probably not. You tell me, hypothesize with us for a second. Uh, immediately, 59% of you say probably not. Uh, which is discouraging, but at the same time, thank you for being honest with us. Thank you for telling us about your experience. It just went up to 62% with only about 6% saying definitely. Um, this is the perception of a lot of leaders around the globe, and hopefully today we can illuminate some more perspective on how teenagers see the church and see how they integrate faith and the work that they would like to do in their time. Uh, I want to transition over to some slides where we're going to talk even more about the open generation, says volume three, how teens around the world can make an impact. Uh, as David shared with you guys, and as you probably know at this point, this is an incredibly ambitious study. Uh, we talked to nearly 25,000 teens around the globe and it's incredibly uh, it's an incredible honor to be able to represent their voices within this data uh, today we want to specifically illuminate some insights around uh, Europe and Africa uh, where many of you from across the globe are uh, tuning in from to see what unique perspectives needs and desires does this uh, segment of the world have and how can we champion the voices of teenagers in the open generation in these places 
Uh, this study is studying the relationship between how teens see Jesus, how they engage with scripture, and how they want to make an impact. And although today is all about impact, I actually want to start us in a place of scripture, in a posture of recognizing what the Lord has asked of us. Uh, in Micah, uh, we are told that he, God, has shown you, mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you, you the open generation, you the church leader, you the lay leader? Uh, the Lord requires of you to act justly and love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Uh, I think this is an incredible foundation and an incredible rootedness for us as leaders to enter into a time of learning what does it look like for the open generation to, to act justly and to love mercy and how do we come alongside them? One of the biggest questions we keep getting asked about in this study uh, around impact is how did we study impact? Uh, the idea of justice is an incredibly diverse topic around the globe. It means different things in different places. And in a global study, you've got to figure out how to make things uh, relatable all around the world. And so we actually did is we asked teens about injustice. Uh, we asked them, by injustice in society, we were referring to the unfair and undeserved treatment of people. So essentially, rather than them telling us uh, about what justice looks like in their context, we asked them to respond to how would they like to make a difference of, uh, around injustices, because while justice is diverse around the globe, injustice is not. Uh, as MLK said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And so this is an incredible opportunity for us to learn how this teen uh, generation wants to make an impact. And we should recognize that they are motivated and they are optimistic. The vast majority of this generation, and even a little bit more amongst those who are Christian or of another religious faith, they say things like, my generation, they have the ability to make a positive and meaningful impact on the world. They are very or somewhat motivated, the vast majority of them, to do something about the unfair and undeserved treatment in pe of people in the world today. So this generation is ready. They are open. And it's up to us to decide how are we going to support them. Well, one of the first things we can do is figure out, well, what are they uh, concerned about? What bothers them? What about the world and its st status today makes them uncomfortable? And so we gave them this long list of options and said, hey, what uh, amongst all these options, what concerns you about the future? Tell us your top five. And the top five around the globe were extreme poverty, global climate change, sexual abuse, unemployment and political corruption. And then you can see across the European and African countries that we studied uh, their top fives because there are different issues in different parts of the world. There are things that are more important in different places. And we can recognize that maybe our role is to learn from them about what they want to impact. Uh, so for example, in Kenya, the number one response was 55% say unemployment really concerns me about the future of the world. Uh, in the Netherlands, the top response was global climate change. In a lot of Europe, we saw that global climate change was one of the top responses. In a lot of Africa, we saw that it was extreme poverty. So take a look at this, find your context, see your neighbors and think, okay, if this is what they're excited about, what do I have to offer them? How can I come alongside them and help them achieve the change that they would like to see in their lifetime? To do that, though, we need to be honest about their perceptions of the church. Uh, you guys just answered a question around how do you think they view the church? Now let's learn how they see the church. And unfortunately, we have to come to terms with the fact that the church has a really mixed reputation amongst this generation when it comes to making a difference on uh, issues such as poverty and justice. So we ask them this question, um, do you feel like the church is making a difference? And about one out of four, one out of five, 23% said definitely. The most selected option was probably. Uh, then one out of five say definitely not. And one out of six say definitely, uh, probably not as one out of four. Uh, and then definitely not one out of six. And so we should also recognize in here, look at that darker group, the no faith group. These are atheists, agnostics, and uh, people of no religion who are standing outside of the church. And about 67% of them say probably not or definitely not. This, this isn't a question about is the church good? Is the church uh, spiritually right? This is a question about is it making a difference? And the people standing outside of the church are saying probably not or definitely not. And the people within the church are pretty unsure themselves.
we also have to recognize that teenagers are less sure about the church and its leader's role. So we ask them, how much of a role, if any, do you think each of the following should play in addressing injustices? And we gave them options like government, schools, politicians, individuals, social media, you yourself, um, businesses. And look at where the Christian church and the Christian leader falls. It falls at the very bottom. Only two out of five say that the ch Christian church or Christian leaders have a major role in addressing injustices. Uh, amongst all these different uh, groups of individuals and in institutions, teenagers are less sure about the church's role. They're less sure about where does it show up in this story. And we need to walk humbly about what does that mean and maybe what uh, are they bringing to us when they're looking for our guidance. Because we also see throughout this data in every single study Barnum Group conducts on next generations that teenagers, young adults, the next generations are integrating faith and impact. They see these things as not two overlapping ideas, but the same idea that their faith and their impact are one thing. Uh, it impacts how they see Christ. For example, uh, we ask people about their favorite uh, identities of Jesus. What about Jesus excites them? And one out of three teens said that they believe that Jesus advocates for justice. And the more motivated a teenager is to address justice, and the closer they are living relationally with Christ, the more likely they are to see that that is a truth about Christ, that he advocated for justice. His message had social implications, political implications. It made a difference in his time for the well-being of others, and they want to be a part of that story. It also impacts how they attend church. We ask teens, what kind of church do you want to attend? Uh, and we allow them to fill in the blank. I would prefer to attend a church that supports. And we see overwhelming support for things like, I would prefer to attend a church that supports ending extreme poverty, positive mental health, ending hunger and famines, ending sexual abuse. These teenagers today, they see that the church has something to offer. They want there to be a bigger role, and they want the church that they attend supporting these things as an active player, as an active advocate for the well-being of others. It also impacts how they engage with scripture. So teenagers across the globe, uh, there's a lot of data here. I'm going to break it down for you pretty quickly. Uh, so on the far left, uh, what you're seeing in the colors are in the red, all teens, in the green, justice motivated teens, and in the purple, Bible engaged teens. And what we see is that the more motivated somebody is to address justice and the more engaged they are with scripture, the more they are to believe that the Christian Bible promotes doing good in the world, promotes the equality of all people, and that it addresses injustices. They also believe that it has teachings about caring for people in poverty, caring for the earth, and promoting the fair treatment of all people. And because of what they've learned in scripture, it is motivating them to make a difference in the lives of others, take care of people who are in, are in need of help, promote fairness and justice, and stand up against the wrongdoings of others. So it, it's not just that they believe it's something out there, it's something that the Bible teaches. It is both a belief a teaching and a conviction of theirs. And the further they get in, the closer they get to Christ, the closer they get to scripture, the more they see this as a truth. So what role do we have to play? We're Christian leaders across the globe. What do we have to do? Uh, where, where do we fit into this? Well, actually, I think where we fit into this is asking them, what do they need? Uh, so we did that in the study. We asked as an individual, would any of the following be helpful to you in addressing injustice? And we gave them a really long list of options. And what you're seeing here, uh, if you look at that farthest left column of global, the top response was they need encouragement, uh, specifically from their family and their friends. They need the people around them aligned with them, encouraging them, championing them on. That was the number one response. Uh, some of the other top responses was, I need somebody to care about the issues and act on them. Um, I need people to teach me how to do this. I've got the conviction, um, but maybe I don't have the confidence. Maybe I need somebody to show me the way. I also need my generation to step up as leaders. Uh, I need the people around me as a generation to step up and start making a difference. Maybe take a second, find your country in here, find your context and see what is it that they're asking of you? What is it they're asking of the church? For a lot of countries, it's that encouragement. Uh, for other contexts, it's things like, I need somebody to present steps for actions. In France, it's one of the top responses. Like, I need somebody to show me the steps to take. 
this is should be encouraging to us. It should be liberating to us that they're giving us a path. They're saying, show up with me, be alongside me. We could do this together. And I think we also need to take the posture of recognizing that Christians in the world today, Christian teens are specifically dispositioned to make a difference. So throughout the, we ask them throughout the rest of your life, how motivated are you to continue learning about injustices in society? We, we ask this question to basically say, is this just a today thing for you? Or do you believe this is gonna be a part of your entire life? And what you see is that Christians are overwhelmingly the group that says, I am very motivated to continue this journey. We should be encouraged by this, not threatened by this. Uh, we should be humbled by it. And we should be excited to set them up to succeed at the things that they are called to. So I wanna leave you guys with one final thought, which is that this study is all about the open generation. But when it comes to making an impact, I think we need to examine our own hearts, uh, the condition of our hearts as leaders. How do we as leaders open a closed fisted church to a generation open, making, open to making a difference? They're ready, they are open. And so maybe this, the calling of this work, this set of data should be, how open are we to meet them where they're at and to set them up for success in their lifetime to achieve the things they are called to do? Uh, as as a, a expression of this, I'd love to lead you guys in a quick liturgy. Um, liturgy is used all around the world as a way to uh, hallmark and milestone the things that we have committed to as a church body, the global church. And so I want to read this with you guys, maybe accept it as a prayer over you about the condition of our hearts as leaders and what we would like to contribute to the story of this next generation. So thank you for taking this time with me. Uh, receive this over you. We, as a church body, we rejoice in every sign of God's kingdom, in the upholding of human dignity and community, in every expression of love, justice, and reconciliation, in each act of self-giving on behalf of others, in the abundance of God's gift, entrusted to us that all may have enough in all responsible use of the earth's resources. We commit ourselves as a church body, individually and as a community to take up the way of Christ, to take up the cross, to seek abundant life for all of humanity, to struggle for peace with justice and freedom, to risk ourselves in faith, hope and love, praying that God's kingdom may come. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven and amen. Thank you all so much for taking this time with me. I hope that this is encouraging to you. I hope it gives you a clear sense of where do we go next with this generation? How do we show up for them? Uh, we would love for you guys to hear from teenagers themselves. We'd love for you to hear their words about what do they need from you and how would they like to make an impact? Thanks so much. They most time forget that the generation we live in is kind of a different generation. And so the more they kind of try to lead this young generation based on the generation, they keep pushing most of this young like generation out of church. And they begin to feel like they don't feel like they belong there. And most of them be like, they feel like they're more outside than into church. We really want a relationship with Jesus all the way. And even if we're doing that in a way that's different than the way that the older generation has done that when they were our age, we still want to have a full, deep relationship with God. Being in person, like at church or whatever, it, it's different to being online. There's an atmosphere. The Holy Spirit is like in church. It's, it's His house. It's God's house. And so I feel like in an age where everything's been so online, everyone's been so digital, our generation really hasn't had as much of like a in-person interaction and then we've got it's been more digital. Our generation could be perceived as quite loud and quite confident, but I think in reality there's a lot of people that struggle with a lack of confidence and and loneliness as well. They need guidance, they need mentoring from them to get strong and stronger in faith. Lots of Teenagers my age who I know, they go undergo stress, they go undergo anxiety and depression. And the root of all that is because they, they don't have any motivation. They don't have any purpose. They don't know what to do in this world. And that's why most of, and that's why these things lead to suicide. These things lead to identity crisis just because they don't know what to do in their life. And 
that's what I want uh, older adults to know, like my parents, um, just so that they could understand what we are going through and just so that they could also know how they could also help us. I think like through just like patience and like gentleness, just being able to just love on people like wherever they are you know, through any struggle they are like going through each day, just being able to be there for them and like. I'm studying neuroscience with the ambition to um, go on to research neurotransmitter diseases such as Alzheimer's and different types of dementia. And for me, that means that hopefully I'll be able to make it a difference in people's lives through improving the quality of their lives and their families. That will allow me to evangelize in that community, in that demographic, and be a light in a place where there seems to be a lot of, lot of dark. Especially in my country, maybe just 10% of the population is um, Christian. I would like to participate in um, evangelization of people. What I dream about is like reach out to influential people, like people who has lots of influence, because if I get to them, I can introduce Jesus, Jesus. they can know him, and then these people can share their experience with God to all the other people. So it's like a massive, Evangelism, you know. Whew. Wow, Joe, that just blows me away. I, you know, I, I can't even pick what my favorite part is, whether it's, it's those incredible, you know, moments of David and Daniel and Danielle, you know, it's Safina's story. But, you know, I actually think that hearing those young people speak, that is so powerful. It just blows me away. Yeah, there's so much to learn from them. There's so much to be inspired by them. And, wow. you know, Nadi, you and I have been talking. It's what's great is this isn't just like a someday type of thing, right? This isn't just like, hey, one of these days, these, these kids are going to grow up to make a difference. Like they're making an impact right now. And it's really inspiring that they don't feel like they have to wait um, to do that someday. They can do it now. In fact, that's kind of the whole inspiration behind this, this thing that we did with, with you guys at World Vision. We came together. Uh, with Daniel Strickland's team as well. And we created what we call the Open Generation Challenge. And what's cool about this is it's free, first of all, so that's awesome. Um, but <laughs> second, it's it's just this kind of what I would describe as a design day in a box, right? It's everything that you need to bring teens and in, in your, your adults together in your church and community to solve problems together in this collaborative spirit, because that's what the research is saying, that teens just don't want to be told what to do and then go do it. They want to be part of the solution. They want to be part of creating the solution. And that's what this resource will help you do. So you can do this as like a, maybe a Saturday or a day off. You kind of bring, you know, teens and, and adults together. Or maybe you want to do it as a weekend retreat. Whatever you want to do, it's adaptable, has everything you need. Training videos by Daniel Strickland and Michaela, uh, how-to videos, a great leader's guide. So again, go to OpenGenerationChallenge.com and enroll for free today. Trust me, uh, this is an incredible resource and you'll definitely not want to miss out on it. Joe, you know, 100%. That's exactly what, what you want to be leaning in to do. Yeah, and the important part about this is that, and I mean, I hope, I hope we've all heard it right loud and clear, that, that uh, the next generation, they're asking for something. They're inviting us into this space. And, you know, it's so important. You know, in actual fact, I think in, in time that's gone by, you know, that's a great teacher for us all. We've seen that, that there are hallmarks, there are almost rites of passage to adulthood. Mm -hmm. And I think one of those is around actually finding your voice, thinking about what needs to change in the world and giving the platform to actually do yeah. it. And we can't lose that art. And that's why I just wanna really exhort you, go, go into this, use this great resource, get on board and think about what you could do to actually change the world. Yeah, I mean, years ago, decades ago, you know, World Vision created this whole experience called the 40 hour famine, or maybe it's a 30 hour famine, depending on where you're at. For me, <clears throat> you know, I, I was a youth pastor and I led my students through, I think, three or four uh, 30 hour famines, one of the most incredible experiences. And you know what I'm excited about, Nadi, is like, what's the next 40 hour famine or 30 hour oh, famine? Okay. And what's cool is something through like the Open Generation Challenge, like, what if uh, like our teens and our students come up with, what what's that next thing that could like globally change the way people engage with faith and 
and make an impact. So anyway, whatever it is, like let's let's like team up with teens, let's uh, collaborate with them and create uh, things for the future that will make an impact with them and for them and alongside them. And and so Nadia, I can't. I, I mean, I'm just so excited that we can offer this resource for absolutely free. Uh, it's super exciting. Hey, Joe, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you what else I'm excited about. I get to chat to the most amazing panel of people, you know, in, in just a moment. And as we lean into that and we get to like pick their brains and actually hear from them, I want to encourage you, uh, you know, feel free to make comments, put stuff in, in the, in the Q and a, we'll, we'll try and gather them up and, and Joe jump back in with some of those great questions that we can kind of wrap up our time together. But Hey, let's, uh, let's get our panel going, shall we? Hey everyone. It's great to have you guys with us. It's so good to actually see you all now. I'm going to quickly whip around the room, you know. So we've got uh, we've got Maureen Moores, and she's from Hillsong. Pass us. So good to have you, Maureen. Simon Gibbs. He's he's from uh, World Vision UK. Chris Kandaya. You know, mate, you are such a legend, and it's so good to have you here. And um, and we've got Joe Bonga, who's the CEO of the ICE in Africa and the SDGs. And and Joe, it's awesome to have you here. And uh, hey, thank you. It's so good to be able to actually uh, have a moment where we get to just pick your brains and find out what's going on for you. So just to get us warmed up, you know, um, I want to whip around with this question, like having listened to the data, having listened to some of the teens, their, their insights, what's grabbed your attention or what's maybe even challenged the way you've been thinking? So Maureen, I'm going to throw to you first. What, what do you got for me? Um, <laughs> I just feel like there's been so much information uh, and it's honestly been amazing. Um, I've literally been writing down all my thoughts, everything. Um, but I think for me, it's been super encouraging and super challenging at the same time, which I'm sure for everyone else. And my question as a youth pastor, I think is like, what, you know, what's the next, what's the new? Um, and this has given such an insight. Uh, I think the thing that stood out to me is that young people are passionate about making an impact, but then where they see the church leaders is actually, they don't really do anything about it. Um, so I'm like, okay, well, what are they asking for? They're asking for us to step up and actually um, help them with it. So for me, I'm super challenged because I'm like, oh, maybe that's the next, maybe that's the new. Um, so it's, it's honestly, yeah, super exciting. Awesome, Maureen. Hey, Chris, what about you, man? What, what's jumped out at you? What's grabbed your attention? Hey, Noddy, great to join everybody today. I, I think the thing that jumps out to me is that young people that read their Bible and believe it to be true are more likely to be passionate about justice. And that's because they're reading the Bible right. And the frustrating thing for me <clears throat> is that the church hasn't really um, captured their imagination. That's the Bible that's done that rather than the church. They're not seeing the church lead on justice. And there are amazing examples around the world where the churches are doing that, but that's not what most young people are seeing. So there's a disconnect there. And totally. I think this is a huge, huge opportunity for us. Who knew the Bible was right, that young people, <laughs> even in their hearts, know this to be true. And we really need to challenge ourselves that we can't get in the way. There's some incredible warnings in scripture when we cause young people to stumble. And we're causing young people to stumble if they're not seeing us live out the Christianity that the Bible calls us to. So I'm both incredibly motivated, but I'm really frustrated that the church is behind young people when it comes to their understanding of scripture and justice. And it should be the other way around, right? We should be the grown-ups. We should be the ones leading the way. But actually, young people are setting an example for us. Chris, you know, um, I, I, it resonates so much with me what you're saying. And we're going to unpack a little bit more. I'm going to come back to you and, and dig a little bit further with you. But let me say this. Where there's frustration, there's also incredible opportunity, right? And that's what we need to be able to, be able to embrace. Hey, Joe, it's so great to have you with us. And um, what, tell me, as you've heard some of this data that's really been unpacked, what's grabbed your attention? Yeah, thank you so much. It's really, really nice to be here. Um, yeah, I think it's really encouraging to hear that um, it's not just something that it's just something happening in the West, but also in Africa. And I'm really encouraged to know that young people are increasingly and having the confidence to even come forth and uh, you know, leave the practical faith. Uh, in Africa, there's been a lot of uh, 
what we call the dichotomy of what is sacred and what is secular. So we have a lot of young people going to church, but then on Monday to Friday, the church doesn't know what to do with them. So they just leave as though the church wants them to have events on Sunday. But I'm also really inspired to also realize that those who have been affected most by injustice are more passionate to even uh, to even take part in in terms of solving the issues of injustice, and they want to know more. And and the problem we're having now in Africa is more maybe the young people are ahead of the church in the sense that they are even challenging the theology of the church, where the church was really just keen on preparing people to get to heaven. Young people are saying, yeah, we want to get to heaven, but we want to also live a better life here on earth and we can do it and we want to do it and want to show you how to do it. And they are bold and they're confident and they want to do it. So uh, it was really nice to see the, the numbers and the statistics. And, and I'm, I'm really, really inspired by that. I mean, we're working with Africa today is home to, um, uh, to uh, about 1.3 billion people, but out of that 41% are below 15 years old. So we are overwhelmed by the catchment here. We are overwhelmed by the, wow. and if this passion is anything to go by, then we are talking about a real army of young people saying, we want to do this right and we want to do it now. Thank you, Joe. That's amazing. And, and you're right, that, uh, that number, the number of young people you have there is incredible, right? So incredible. Mm -hmm. Hey, Simon, what about you, man? Just quickly, what's, what's something that's grabbed you? Hey, Noddy, uh, great to be here. And uh, as you can tell, Kiwi accent, not an Australian one. So let's just put that out there to, to begin with. <laughs> Kiwi Living in the UK. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it was an amazing presentation, wasn't it? And I think, you know, one of the things that initially struck me was, was the sense of optimism in this emerging generation. I think with so much access to information and, you know, this globally connected generation, I might have thought that they would have been a bit more cynical about the state of the world but they have this underlying sort of confidence and sense of belief in themselves. I think it was 59% of teenagers believe that they personally can have a positive impact on the world. And that is not to be taken lightly that they personally, you know, they, they feel that sense of responsibility. And I think it was Daniel who, Daniel who <clears throat> brought out the finding that particularly Christians are motivated theologically by that. So that potentially it is is a change in in terms of you know church and a, an approach to injustices around the world so yeah all really encouraging stuff but that was one of the things that really struck me initially thank you simon hey joe i, I want to talk to you for a moment um and i'll get this right i know on the ica africa website it, it actually states this it says we find that young people are inspired by integrity and justice and have a desire to see their country change. I, I, I want to ask you, what, why do you think that is? And what aspects about um, justice and integrity are appealing to young people? Oh, no, we just lost him. And, and Joe was having uh, some difficulties with his tech beforehand. So if we can grab him back on, we will. And we'll come back and circle back around that question. Right, I'm going to go straight back round to, uh, to Simon. Simon, um, I know firsthand, you know, World Vision spent a lot of time, uh, you know, over the last 70 years really investing in that next generation. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I know that that's probably a key focus even for you, but I, I, I'd love to know, what are you guys noticing that's different in the open generation um, than what has been in the previous generations? And um, what's giving you hope about that? Yeah, so I'll, I'll sort of continue on with the thought that I that I began just a moment ago. Um, I think what's interesting is they, you know, the, the emerging generation have this have this sense of optimism, but I, I've seen a little bit of the research, so I can so I can go back to what I've seen. Um, but what we're Jeez, also seeing with that Simon. sense of yeah, a little inside more. <laughs> what we're also seeing with that optimism is also a sense of realism. So I think it's something like you know, 45% of teens are neutral about um, um, about seeing themselves as future leaders. So there's a real sense of optimism, which is married with that realism, which is a really sweet mix, I think. Because, okay, so I'm a millennial. <clears throat> and speaking um, for me, and maybe some people in my generation, you know, we were told um, how special we were. And um, we, we, we were loved a lot. 
And, um, you know, I think, I think that um, led to a little bit of entitlement in our generation. And I think even led some of us to some sense of delusion about our place in the world and our, our contributions to it. And then when we found out that we, that we couldn't maybe have that lofty kind of contribution to the world, it led, led to a sense of cynicism. And I'm honestly seeing in a lot of my friends, you know, 30s, um, a real sense of skepticism and cynicism about their place and their contribution in the world, which, which is a really uh, derailing kind of place to be. And so I think what's sweet about the, the emerging generation is what we're seeing is, is the sense of confidence and optimism married with, a, with, with some realism to it. And I think that's that's really encouraging. Even in marginalised communities, Noddy, um, we're seeing you know that 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 sort of data replicated, which is which is really encouraging. I think for for this emerging generation, something to be confident about. Great, great <clears throat> insight, Simon. I, I love it. Hey, Krish. I mean, I, we know that you founded Home for Good, you know, which really encouraged the church to actually lean into you know thinking about fostering or, or adoption, um, and and most recently, uh, Sanctuary. Um, foundation uh, to support refugees from both Afghanistan and Ukraine. My, my question for you is, um, as you're seeing this next generation, in those people and those teens that, that are vulnerable and that have been caught in these spaces, um, talk to me about what you're noticing in them and even their path to resilience and what perhaps we could learn from them. Wow, big question, Noddy. I, I would say, look, this this moment in history, as we're looking at this data, it, it tells us that um, the church really needs to reboot what we think our central purpose is. Mm. We, we've been making it about gathering to sing and listen to teaching. That, that's been the kind of bottom line. And if you ask someone how big their church is, they're normally going to tell you how many people turn up on a Sunday morning to sing and listen to Bible teaching. They, they don't talk about how many people are activated in the church community to actually make a difference in the world and that's what these young people are teaching us and so what we've been doing over the you know various different initiatives whether it's working with refugees or whether it's empowering people to foster or adopt children we're just empowering the church to do what we're called to do and when we do that there's a sense of momentum and movement and you know what you want to read your bible more you want to praise and worship more but you're doing it to equip you for the central task that god has called us to do and i find when people actually live out their faith, that's where the resilience comes in. You know it to be true. You're not just a passive listener who stands up when you're told to stand up and listen when you're told to listen. You've proved this to be true in your life, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And that gives you a robust faith that allows, then allows you to go and reach out into the world. So I, I think this, this survey and its results is a wake up call for us to rediscover biblical Christianity. When, when God, asks us um, to respond to him his top priority is always caring for the vulnerable you know james 1 27 classic verse um, religion that god our father accepts as pure and blameless is listening to preaching and singing in church no sorry religion that god our father accepts as pure and blameless is to care for the widow and orphan in their distress so we need to release the church to do what we're called to do and our young people are going to be the engine that really force us forward to do that so i'm really excited about this that will help us in a whole bunch of ways including young people building resilient faith hey chris that's so good you know i love about what you just said then it, it really is flipping the script isn't it you know we we think that we we go to church to do this thing and that's our christian faith and then somehow that leads to action but the, the next generation they're, they're flipping that script to say no we're going to live this out and the outpouring of that is you know we're going to gather in community and worship god it's so good Hey, um, Joe, welcome back. Sorry, we had that bit of a technical glitch. Um, I, I don't know whether you heard my question, but I'll see if I can shorten it for you. Um, on, on the website, the organization actually calls out this, this incredible, um, you know, relationship between integrity and justice and the thought that young people really want to change the, their country with that. I, I wanted to know from you, what, in your perspective, what's so important about integrity and justice and what, what's the attraction for the open generation in that? Mm. Uh, I think I've, you've frozen again, Joe. I'm so sorry. All right, I, I'll come back to you. Maureen, 
Now, tell me, I've got a similar question for you um, as, as I kind of asked Simon, but I, I want to hear it from the church context. You, you are a youth pastor, and, and so within the church context, um, I want to know, because, I mean, the data calls out, you know, those, those that are kind of embedded in their faith and those that aren't. I want to hear from you, what do you notice in the church context for this next generation and what's different to what's come before? Yeah, great question. Um, what I think I'm noticing, and again, I think we are seeing like a bit of a pattern here, is that the young people now, they, you know, they don't care about church being cool. They don't care about things looking good. They actually do care about the heart of it. And they want to, you know, a quote from, from whatever isn't going to get them far. They actually want to know, hey, what does the Bible say? Um, and they actually, like, they're hungry for it, which is so encouraging. And I think if we can get that, that we don't need to be the coolest youth pastors in the world, you know, with my red hair. Um, but you know what I mean? Like, they, they actually, they're hungry for what actually makes a difference. Like, we had um, our Social Justice Sunday, um, which was a longer service than usual. You know, back in the day, that would have been, you know, a few sleeping youth or it just would have been um, a little bit of complaints and stuff but what I've seen is actually that they're hungry for that they don't mm. care that it's not slick they actually care that it has heart and that um, we're doing what the bible actually says you know what I mean like we're actually helping like exactly what you said Chris um, we're helping the vulnerable and they care like that's the service that they're going to invite their friends to mm. like that's the youth group on a Friday when we talk about okay what are we going to do this Christmas for for the people that you know maybe without our help wouldn't have a, a, a good time or would it, do you know what I mean? Like they care about that stuff. And yeah, I, I just think that's super encouraging. Like they are, it's exactly what we're all saying. Like we're all on the same page here. And I'm seeing that with our young people, which is just, yeah. It's, it's hey, Maureen, that's awesome. Don't, don't you reckon that's actually life giving to realize you don't have to put on a show. You just have to find yeah. that sort of authentic heartbeat of where they're going. It's so good. Okay, Joe, I'm going to try again. Did you hear my question? I, I, I want to know the relationship yeah, I between did, I did. integrity and justice, you know, and that next generation. What Talk to me about that. Yeah, I got your question. I'm sorry, I'm really in one of those very remote places near the border of Uganda and Kenya in the most unreached people group. So it's really quite, you know, a God thing to have the internet today here. <laughs> Um, yeah, anyway, I think um, what I want to say is that young people in Africa have always been victims of injustice. Uh, so for a very long time, either directly or they have seen their parents or they have seen their communities, people who go through a lot of injustice issues. So that has really motivated their, in their interest uh, to become part of the agents for, uh, for the fight for justice. So and one of the things that I really, really appreciate is with the young people in the church, the young people in the church have found that connection between theology and justice. Or let me say they have found the theology of justice in the Bible and them finding this on their own way has given them really kind of the impetus or the courage to kind of think creatively or innovatively around ways to, uh, to, to, to go through, to, to go around them. Integrity, uh, they have been really victims of bad leadership. And the bad leadership in Africa has brought a lot of issues that affect young people. And when you are talking about 41% of young people, of people in Africa being under 15, we are talking about almost 68 to 72. They are about being under 35. You're talking about people who are really optimistic for the future. Africa has never been this young. So I'm very sure that the optimism level in Africa has never been this high. So that has really made the young people to come together agree on the kind of life they want to live in the future. They have come, kind of realized that they've got lots of years in Africa than they would have anywhere else compared to their previous generations who came to Christ when they were much older. Previously, people would come to Christ when they're in their 50s, they had everything, and so they were almost just ready to get, get their lives to, uh, to Jesus and get to heaven. Now we are having teenagers coming to God and they're saying, yes, I know I'm looking forward to heaven, but I want a better life. And I don't want a life like my dad. I don't want a life like my uncle. I don't want a life like this and that. They have examples right in front of their eyes where they can see the impact of, uh, of injustice. And um, again, the global connectivity has shown them how different parts of the world, different people are experiencing 
different quality of lives based on the integrity of leadership, based on the justice system within those contexts. And so they are interested to have that kind of lives in their own context. Now, recently there has been a survey that found out that 91, 91% of young people in Africa want to start their own business or want to be entrepreneurs. They have also realized that there's a lot of corruption that really threatens that desire. So their desire to push for integrity is not only for having a better community, but also setting a better stage for the kind of desired lives that they want to, uh, they want to live. And finally, I think it's because young people did not see the church take that take justice and integrity seriously, because all that used to happen was the legalistic system in our church made sure that when a young man sins, he's sent out of the church. There was no there was no hearing, there was no listening. That was just like you are a teenager, you got pregnant, you get out of the church. You are this and that, you got a funny hairstyle, you dress funnily, you get out of the church. Mm -hmm. Young people have witnessed in Uganda when the church supports gays to be killed, people who have different sexual feelings or attractions to be killed. I mean, so they have come to a point where they're starting to realize that these people are their friends. These people are their brothers. These people are their uncles and, and aunties. And so now they are picking a different uh, approach and that they are also advising the church on how to approach the hard issues. The church is, is, is a bit in a limbo because they're dealing, it's, it's an old leadership church dealing with a high number of teenagers with traditional methods. And so what is happening is young people are telling the church, we are not quitting Jesus. We are just leaving your rooms of gathering until you put that house in order. And, and, and that encourages us because they are not taking injustice as, 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 in, as something that takes them out of Jesus, but they are using Jesus to, to sharpen their lenses to see the context of their communities and the theology, and they're advising the church. Some of the church members are listening, church of the church leaders, some of the church leaders are listening, and they're able to bring dialogue, and they're able to talk about the hard questions. We have serious issues in Africa concerning sexuality, LGBTQ, environment, what we call toxic femininity, I mean, toxic feminism, that is trying to split the families. They are, uh, they, 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 they are seeing all this, and I think that's why they want to create a platform where they don't have a repeat of what their predecessors went through, and they're also trying to set a stage where theology can be written from the lens, from the a contextualized theology. All we've had has always been a lot of importation, which is good in concept, but then it's been lacking in context. And young people are saying, we want to take part in contextualizing these amazing principles. We want to mm -hmm. take part in collaborations but they are different from their predecessors who would collaborate for resources to build churches, to run programs. They are collaborating for accountability. They are saying, if there is no accountability in these collaborations, we don't want to go into this. They are looking for collaborations that see them as equal partners who are able to contribute something on the table. They are refusing to be dependents. And they're saying we might not have the physical ability, but at least we have the mental ability, we have the psychological ability, we have the networking, we have the team, and we wanna work together with other people around the world. And that has really helped us to kill denominationalism that was splitting the church. And so the church is being united by the young people who are constantly united on common agendas and common issues and coming up with adaptable, innovative ways of doing things differently in a way that the church has no excuse but to integrate those, uh, uh, you know, those methods and approaches within their theological frameworks. Uh, yeah, I think that that's what I would say for that. That's awesome. I got to jump in real quick because Joe, what you just, one thing you said that jumped out, there were so many good things, but like they're not quitting Jesus. They're just waiting for us to put our house in order. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh man, what what a great great thought! What a great challenge for all of us, right? I mean, incredible. Well, hey, Naughty, we're out of time. I just want to say thanks to our great panel. Such great wisdom, such great experience shared. Mm. We appreciate the time you guys have taken out of your day to help us uh, figure out ways we can, uh, you know, empower this generation to make an impact. So, thank you all for being here. 
Yeah, it was such a privilege to connect with you guys. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Hey, Joe, we are out of time, but you know what? There's no better way to actually close out this time than by being prayed for by one of the young people we've been chatting to. And before we chuck them up, let me just say a huge thank you to Barna, huge thank you to you, Joe, to, to David Kinnaman, to Daniel Copeland, to Daniel Strickland, to that incredible panel, and a huge thank you to everyone for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us as we lean into this really important topic. And as we've said before, it's just the beginning, but uh, we really appreciate each and every one of you. Yeah, so let's be led by uh, in, in a closing prayer by Julieta from Argentina uh, as we close out today's webinar. God, for this opportunity to be here. Thank you for this family. Thank you for your church. Thank you for um, creating this movement, creating this space for us to talk, for us to express ourselves. And thank you for all the things that you're doing. Thank you for rise our generation to uh, help with your plans for this for these times and God I pray for for us I pray for unity I pray for um, for us to be more united for us to be um, aware of what you want to do uh, in these times I pray for your church to shine with your light to be united with your love with your joy and I really pray for us to make a difference in these times that are hard, are difficult, but I pray for them, for us to rise up and to show your light because your light makes everything better. So thank you for your church. Thank you for all that you're doing, for what you've done and what you are going to do also. So thank you and I pray in Jesus name, amen. 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 Well, hey, thanks again for joining us, everyone. Uh, just youth pastors, workers, volunteers, educators, advocates. Uh, thanks for everything you do to invest in pouring into this generation. Keep keep doing what you're doing. Fight the good fight. We're behind you. All of these organizations that partner together, uh, we did it for, for for you to equip you, and then we also did it to empower this generation to make an impact because we believe that they can. Bless you guys. Thank you so much for joining us. All right. Take and care. Remember, it's just the beginning. <laughs> it is.